Off the cutting room floor and its host has no association with Santo Riga Tusso, Robert Bob Harris, Joey So, Santo Gold, Blood Circus, or any related business, alias, or entity. All information presented has been gathered through public sources. Picture it. Baltimore. February 9th, 1985. 2,800 rabid wrestling fans gathered inside the Royal Farms Arena, then known as the Baltimore Civic Center, to be extras in a film promised by its creator to take the world by storm. All for the price of $9.95. Attendees were told they would see 20 world-famous wrestlers rip each other's heads and arms off. However, as stated in a 1985 issue of the Washington Post, there was, quote, too much film, too much waiting around, not enough wrestling, and certainly, not enough blood. Many asked for their money back. Strangely, no one received it. What nobody knew is that the film would never see a wide release, soon becoming embroiled with the frauds of its creator destined to become a staple of the lost media community. I'm Joss Hoskinson, and this is Off the Cutting Room Floor. Episode 1, The Scrappy Young Barber. spotting all kinds. Not much is known about the early life of Santo Victor Regasso. Here's what is known. He was born sometime in early March 1945 in Baltimore. Both his father and grandfather were barbers. Upon his father's death, who seemed strict according to a neighbor of the family, in 1961 he too became a barber, taking over the family shop and dropping out of Edmondson High School around the same time. The decision likely wasn't hard. At age 12, he was taken to a psychiatrist by his parents because, quote, he was different. Soon, he was diagnosed with Tourette's Syndrome, and, according to Santo, he saw a psychiatrist six times a week for years. Because children can be terrible to each other, defense attorney David B. Irwin told the Baltimore City paper in 1990, He was terribly tortured in school because of his nervous tics. He's incredibly scarred by it. That said, he was good at what he did, with Earl Riddle, an old neighbor, telling the publication, He was a very good barber who would talk to you about most anything. He was just a regular guy who ran a barber shop. There was, however, another side to the young Santo, an entrepreneurial side, which was on full display in a 1968 ad in Baltimore's The Evening Sun. Order now. We are now preparing the Instant Easter Package. With a full-page letter, prepares children of all ages for Easter, mailed to each child's name by saying it's from the Easter Bunny, Bunnyland. Stuffed with delicious candies, grass, toys, novelties, gadgets, giant Easter card, and secret gift. Free mystery presents included when you order before March 1st. Only $1 plus 25 cents postage and handling per package. Print names or nicknames. Cash, check, or money order to Mr. Santo Rigatuso. The rest of his youth and young adulthood can be summed up rather quickly. By 1968, Santo had transformed the barbershop into a music shop had married and moved to Florida by the end of the 70s, and in 1980, he and his family moved back to Baltimore. Oh, and he was injured on April 11, 1962, in a fight with four other men. All involved in the fight were barbers. I just found this little factoid amusing. It has nothing to do with the rest of the story. In 1982, Joe Kazernikowski, the owner and host at the Brentwood Inn restaurant, served Santo and his family with the restaurant going up for auction in the near future. I knew I was going to need a job. Joe told the Baltimore City paper in 1990. He seemed like a very likable guy. He was talking about how he was going to need some help with his new business. Up until then, he and his brother said they were working in advertising. I spoke up and I was working with him later in the month. The first product he remembers Santo selling? A wristwatch that played the melody of The Yellow Rose of Texas. The deal was, you'd get a man's watch and a woman's watch for $39.95. The man's watch would play it, but the woman's wouldn't. But, once they ran out of watches, Joe joined Santo on a new venture. I think the first thing we sold was an 11-piece chain set, which went for $19.95. The Santo Gold process, according to Santo, 
was developed in 1982 as a way to produce cheap yet high quality jewelry, with a letter sent out to customers describing it as thus. First, quality steel wire is cut and faceted into individual links, over 100 in all. Next, these links are wound and formed into an interlocking bracelet. Each link is cut by skilled craftsmen. A jump ring and foldover latch are then attached by hand. The wire bracelets are then treated with Santo Gold's secret patented formula. Finally, real 24 karat gold is electrostatically bonded, producing a high luster coating. Joe served as the media buyer for Santo, buying ad spots for the business between usually $200 to $1,500 per spot, with 30 to 40 spots a week airing on over 100 stations nationwide. From practically the moment advertisements for Santo Gold started in late 1982, there were complaints to the Postal Authority, complaints of refunds that were never received, complaints from people who received cash-on-delivery packages, even though they hadn't actually ordered anything. Eventually, Icarus flew too close to the sun. In Balakanid, Pennsylvania, in November 1984, a cash-on-delivery package, boldly stamped with, You ordered this from TV, arrived on the steps of a postal inspector who, in fact, had not ordered anything from TV. A major complaint, however, was just how awful the jewelry was. Despite ads telling buyers they would be getting pure 24 karat gold, evidence presented in a state administrative hearing showed that the electroplated layer of gold was not only 1 15th to 1 100th of an inch thick, it also wasn't, funnily enough, 24 karat gold. According to Special Prosecutor for the Maryland Attorney General's Consumer Protection Division, Roger Wolf, people either didn't get what they ordered or they thought the merchandise was trashy. According to Joe, Santo was apparently good at keeping things on the down low. I never knew anything about what was going on until much later. We'd get TV stations asking us about certain coupons we sent to people when we ran out of merchandise, but I never heard anything about fraud on my end. With pressure mounting on the company, Santo Gold soon folded. However, through the use of a few new aliases and business names, and switching to UPS for deliveries, Santo and the jewelry business were quickly back on their feet. Postal regulations be damned. And in 1985, production began in earnest on the project that would gain Santo Gold infamy. A production, it seems, that began with a nondescript classified ad. Help Wanted. Actors and Actresses. This has been Off the Cutting Room Floor. The cast featured in order of appearance were Hunter, the host of Murder and Such, as Santo Regazzo, Maxwell, the host of Relic, the Lost Treasure podcast, as David B. Irwin, Josh, co host of Rumor Flies, as Joe Kazernikowski. Podcasts and social links for the cast can be found in the show notes. Opening and closing theme, Always Slept So Soundly, is by Sarasu, off the EP Domestications. He can be found at soundcloud.com slash sarasu and on Twitter at sarasu music. Oh, and while you're at it, go to covidvaxinfo.com. Got corrections? Want to get in touch? Shoot me a message at Joss Hosky on Twitter, the show at OTC Room Pod everywhere, or send an email to cuttingroompod at gmail.com. Want to support the show and what I do? Become a patron at patreon.com slash joss share the show with your friends, or leave a rating and review on your podcatcher of choice. Sources for this episode can be found in the show notes. To find transcripts and any corrections, visit cuttingroompod.tumblr.com. And again, that's covidvaxinfo.com. Opening and closing theme. Always slip so... <laughs> so close, so close.